Well, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, uh, to our first meeting of the year. Uh, and it's a uh, great pleasure to introduce uh, Alan Hartley Smith, uh, who started work on Marconi systems uh, when he was in the RAF doing his national service. Uh, subsequently, joined Marconi at the Great Maddo Laboratories on the radar research group. Uh, uh, had a career there eventually, moving to UNIST. So, Alan's going to be speaking to us about Coney, another British human manufacturer. There we are, that's good. Yeah. That's fine. Right, well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you for coming along. It's four years since I last gave this presentation. It's rather nice to be invited to uh, to do it again. But one thing I have found in the interim period is probably because Marconi, along with a lot of other the big companies, of course, has now disappeared completely from view. And so what I've done, I've added in a small, a, a very quick run through of how we got where we got to, why and when and how we did it, because I think it's important to see why we got into computers in the first place. So let's start. We've lived in uh, an involving environment all the time because Marconi himself, of course, personally initiated a period of technology growth with the introduction of wireless per se. He was the iterator of the first global communication system, peacefully on the ship to shore, and then aggressively when the Navy and eventually the airborne and ground military took it up in World War I. And as ever, of course, wartime stimulated the development, and in particular, the use of direction finding, which is when we move from communication to data collection, which, of course, is where we come into the computer side. We also moved from telegraphy to telephony uh, as the world went on. And post-war, of course, they added radio broadcasting and at that point in time also civil air to air to ground came in because the use of aircraft in uh, normal circumstances carried on after the war the advent of television came in the 30s and at the beginning of the second world war we really saw the start of the system of producing information when the ground naval air defensive offensive came in using radar Post-war, post-World War II, civilian aircraft came in and eventually, of course, the whole thing evolved into what we now term the science and industry of electronics. So we've evolved from the beginning of wireless coming in right through to where we are now with our own computers. The naval environment, this is how we all started. One board ship with the operator supplied by the company, surrounded by kit. The air then came in where we had these very simple little systems installed in the aircraft and we became connected to the ground with the operators liaising with the people in the aircraft. The army was involved also during the war and thereafter and this is a training picture of the army corps being trained on the use of this new technology. And most importantly, I think, to, with reference to what we are now talking about, radio direction finding came in, the first use of the acronym RDF. This enabled the communication system to be used to find the location of the station that you were listening to. And this became very important during both world wars. So we were evolving our purpose all the time. Operating mainly in real-time environments from the word go, and, and we mean really real, because, of course, if you are monitoring what an enemy is doing, it isn't very often that he will let you know what it is he's going to do. So they are positively uncooperative, and you get very few steady-state conditions when the system is fully operating. You don't know how many of what are going to be around, so we have unknown load levels. You don't know how long an interception is going to go on, so your variable duration of operation. And as you can see, when you're talking about air defense systems, unexpected system downtime is not really an option. 
and as things progress of course you've got constant unknown changes in the environment so the existence of the operation capabilities of anything that we're talking about really were not very well known at the point in time so you're you're working in a really different environment to the start of the second world war this is when things really moved up a gear because of course radar came in which was the ultimate at that point in time detection with an operator looking and giving corrections on the aircraft and at that point in time using computer terms our end user was of course the spitfires as things progressed we had to look at the aircraft coming in much lower down the system and so the new radar chain home low came in now that is an illustration of it over on the left hand side and as you can see the top aerial is much more familiar with what most people think of as radar chain home was floodlit this is now normal radar with a scanner on top and most importantly this was enabled by the invention and development of the magnetron um, we were involved because Mark only set up a company specifically for manufacturing these devices. Later, things evolved and the system evolved into larger and larger scanners, that is a Type 7, and the displays got more and more complex. And of course, not only that, uh, end user now were fighter aircraft with jets. And so, again, the system had to cope with that improvement. Also, civil systems started to come in. So we now were designing civil radar systems, and our client then, of course, were standard airliners. So we're talking again about a different type of end user with different requirements. Post war, it was decided that the UK system of air defense must be revised, and Marconi, in fact, got the contract for doing it and what resulted was a whole series of basically underground sites this is the r3 bunker at rf holton and what you would find if you went down into one of those were ranks and racks of equipment brand new displays much more capability and you attended to have your systems working in little operations areas as you can see at the bottom right there with two operators in front of the system but that level of racks was not just like that on one floor. There were several floors of that type of equipment. Don't forget, these days we are talking analog. Also, our devices were getting bigger and heavier. That is our 90 foot Type 85 scanner, much more uh, able to give you very long range views. We even developed a system where called where the enemy's own attempt at jamming could be turned against him. This was a system called passive detection. Our military end users again, even faster fighters and bigger bombers. This is a Russian bear being escorted off the premises by the RAF. We're still working with the Navy, and now you've got a very typical system here where at the masthead you've got the surveillance radar. In the center, there are missile control radars, and in that case, the end user is on stream right, and these are the launchers for the Sea Wolf missiles. Army was not neglected. This was the type of system they would use for uh, controlling intercept rockets. Finally, we got to the point where the radar systems had really grown, and now we aren't just providing distance and so forth, we're providing height as well. And we're also building and using solid state devices. That is a large 743 radar over on the left. And finally, we got to working with over horizon radars. If you can believe that, it does actually work civil side now grew up and we not only had primary radar but we had secondary radar and this is where the aircraft is cooperating with the system on the ground providing you with data to enable you to control it air traffic control at heathrow is a good example of what we had to cope with if you look on the left that is a, a view taken from one of these 
little sites you can log into of the aircraft activity over London at that point in time. Air traffic control had to organize that lot so that on the right hand side you see five aircraft being lined up to land at London Heathrow at something like one minute intervals. So air traffic control has that job. Towards the end, of course, we had brand new users. Both Luton Hilly and Apollo were space systems, one for communication, the other one for communicating with the Apollo aircraft, uh, the aircraft spacecraft landing of the, on the moon in that particular case. So what we actually had was a very comprehensive technical background. Because of the people we had back from the war, we had staff with both user and designer backgrounds. Because of the different areas we were working in, you had distinct equipment ranges with specialized applications. Now, because of the nature of most of our work, it was not generally known that we were in this market. It very rarely got put up in the news. And of course, eventually the whole thing disappeared because of the UK industrial malaise. In terms of data handling involvement, we were involved right the way through the Second World War with the generation mainly of radar data. And we were working with government establishments pretty well all the time with the telecom research establishment on an air defense information system, the radar research and development establishment. We're working with Intertrace of all 3D radars, with the Admiralty for a comprehensive display system for ships. And circa 1949, we were involved in the study and implementation for the new contracts to improve the system called VAST and Rotor. And that was then re-establishing the UK radar defence system. And that we also, of course, have added now the Civil Aviation Authority and we had civil air traffic control and particularly the use of in secondary radar, which I've already shown you. Now, most of this work was actually carried out by the Bado Research Division, and that has originally been formed in 1937 by consolidating individual research units around the company. During the war, it was taken over completely by the government and the services, mainly concerned with atmospheric systems uh, for predicting the best wavelengths to use for communication. Post-war, because of the work we were doing now on improving the UK system, the Radar Datamation Group now designed analog processing and display technology. And the main development, which was for the, DK, for the UK defence system, was a fixed coil display system to enable intertrace marking. That is, putting marking on the radar screen in addition to the position shown by the simple radar return. Now, during all this time at Bado, the whole lot was supported by most of the other groups. And I don't know whether any of you do know Bado, but it worked on fundamental material work and theoretical and practical applications. So we were able within the company to do basic development with square one. The stimulus that, right, that got us into the use of computers was that, in fact, germanium transistors started to become available. Uh, and that triggered work now on looking at digital subsystems. So Bado was now working on counters, storage modules, integrators, character generators, which we'll talk about a bit later, and a series of logic gates. Storage at that time mainly used an acoustic line, but we did work on a core store system. Now, this was a stimulus not only from the equipment, but in 1957, a private venture opportunity, that is the company would take on the, uh, on the task of doing this at its own expense. And this arose to supply a completely new system for the Swedish Air Force. Looking at what we could do, there was an in-depth review within our research division. It was decided a proposal would be made and it was accepted. And this resulted in the creation of a big new project, which was called Her Hat. Her Hat actually was looking at what the Swedish referred to as the Strill 60, an integrated system for aerial warfare control. So it had early warning radar and ground control interception. 
but they wanted to use computer systems. It was in the front line of providing combat critical information to airborne fighter aircraft using digital tomato drinks with direct presentation of the target guidance on gauges in the instrument panels of the aircraft. And the Swedes were the first in the world to provide this sort of digital combat guidance, and that would remain reliable in a hostile environment. Now, this was designed in cooperation with Marconi. We and the Swedes worked together to design the system. The main thing was that the project involved the major development now of computer-based data processing and a, a whole range of special peripheral activities and devices. There was a spin-off for us as the company as well, that because in 1956 Marconi's had been taken over by the English Electric Company, and they, of course, were already manufacturing uh, uh, versions of computers. So this is what was started in computing, which is why I needed to go through the introduction. So this led us to our first computer, TAC, the Transistor Automatic Computer, called in normal terms, a fast generation general purpose for real time applications. Three machines were necessary for to do the fur hat system for adjusting the data. And also because we had them and we were working in connection with uh, the other company, two machines were given to the Wilfred nuclear power station. Now they were installed in 1966 to handle the monitoring and the alarm system. And when they were running, they provided continuous service nonstop from 1968 until 2004. And as far as we've been able to ascertain, that probably makes it the longest running computer in the world. In fact, one of them now, the main Wilfer Wilf machine, is now in TMOC. And you can go and have a look at it because it's being restored by Steve Kay. Other, there is another one, but that's not are not available for use it's in a private collection now we reckon that from the records we managed to locate from date from the files there were seven tax produced altogether the technical details were it was originally fitted with a magnetic drum storage display screens and the input device was mainly freezing and flexorizer electric typewriters which of course incorporated tape control as well it had 4,096 20-bit words of core, mainly using acoustic storage, and paper tape was used for the program loading. But somewhat unusually for that period, TAC was micro-coded with a very complex instruction set. This is what it looked like. We were well versed, of course, in the use of racks, and on the left-hand side, that is a complete TAC taking four racks worth of equipment. The individual work of uh, the, the data processing system were these boards that you see on the right hand side. They were plug in high speed logic boards and they had six three input gates using DTL logic. And they were using the micro alloy transistors you can see individually mounted. And they were edge connected in on the rack as you see on the left hand side. So that was our first venture into microelectronics. This was the other form of storage, the acoustic line storage. And basically what we had was we assigned one track of the aircraft operations to each of these stores. So the stack was as many as tracks as the system was able to handle. This was what we devised for the display part of the system. We tried to incorporate a range of bits and pieces that people would like. So on the left hand side, you've got the television type of presentation. The one next to long is a tabular display, which I'll talk about more in a moment. And the two on the right hand side are specialized radar displays. Now these could be configured in various ways to produce all the requirements that the Swedes required for operating the system. The special display I mentioned was most of the many of the other peripherals that we did and it was the first electronic tabular display system it enabled the, the computer now to communicate with the user in english as you see there but of course in the fur hat system it was communicating in swedish but now the computer was effectively 
not net, not talking verbally, but talking on the screen to you. Uh, one of these systems was also actually used by Inks Electric in a control system for a steel rolling mill. Now, at this point, I have to declare an interest because the uh, the tablet display was my particular contribution to the Furhat system. But this is me showing as a piece of vanity. It's because it incorporates all of the different technologies that were used. On the top, you see the big round cathode ray tube, which for many years we still had to use for displays. And at the bottom of that rack are the driving circuits for the tube, which of course itself used thousands of volts. And the electronics at the bottom, the tubes use hundreds of volts. But most importantly, at the top of the rack are our new boys. These are the transistor character generator system, and they, of course, are now working on 10 volts. So there you see the move from one extreme to the other. If you actually want to see one of the systems as it was eventually, uh, um, this is not the fur hat system. This is, in fact, the uh, RAFA Defense Radar Museum and ETS head. But as you can see, it does incorporate the same display system. So you can actually go and see one of our systems in situ. This is the control room at, uh, at Neatishead as was. It's now incorporated in the museum. While we were working on that as a system, the uh, research boys, of course, were not standing still. They were launched us quite happily into using what we were working with TAC, but now they started to experiment with even higher speed logic systems, and now high speed ferrite core storage was coming along. Uh, and they, in fact, put these two together, and uh, in order to test what was being done, they put it together and referred to it as the IP, the high speed miniature processor. And this was done, uh, the management knew something was happening, but not exactly what. But when they decided to reveal it as a working condition, that in fact the next computer, the team were then asked to design a production machine based on the lessons that had been learned. This did involve designing a completely new range of circuit elements, board systems and mounting systems, power supplies and housing. So they were getting on with this in the research unit while we were still installing TAG. And this is what IMP came out looking like. We now got down from the racks that you saw to effectively a desk unit. And what had been on a board was now more or less enclosed in the TO5 can. You can mount a collection of those on a small printed circuit board and many of those could be mounted on a larger printed circuit board, which is how we were able to condense, condense the system down. The use of PCs like this, the printed circuit, was complete within our capability. We designed and manufactured all of these ourselves. So this is a completely home-produced machine. And the imp actually now resides in the Science Museum store. We know it's still there, but we haven't been able to get at it. <laughs> this is what the final machine looked like when it went into production, the Myriad 1, built into effectively a desk, with, and it even had a battery-powered backup to support short-term power failure. It was used for all our critical real-time applications, that's the civil ATC and the military systems, but it also was used for another thing that we produced, which were transportable convoys, which we'll talk about in a minute. So this was the first of the slightly bigger machines. The reduced complexity of the circuits enabled us to increase the speed of operation. It was much faster than any other commercially available machine at the time. And the intrinsic high speed of the logic, we did no longer need to resort to artificial little tricks and means to basically speed up what had been the much slower systems. So the simplification led to the bigger reliability, reduced cost, and of course, much smaller size, but it was still meeting our stringent military requirements. The technical details were the elements now consisted of a number of silicon semiconductor and resistor devices integrated, as you saw, into TO5 cans. Most interconnections were thermocodrogen bonds within the cans, which gives a far higher reliability. They were very high speed devices, the stage delay being about eight nanoseconds. 
<laughs> input and output was by a program that looked about six to eight microseconds. And we were developing various languages. There is its user code at Algol, plus a new real time language, Coral. And we designed and incorporated a highway principle, which enabled us to link a very large number of peripheral devices very easily to the system. It had many applications. Air defense systems was our particular forte. But the Cambridge Radio Telephone Control System was built using Myriads. Central Electricity Research Labs bought some because they were experimenting them. And it also went into the Western Flight Plan Processing System, but which more later for the air traffic control people. Our sister company, Marconi Communication Systems Limited, also took it on and they were designing message switching systems. There were also experiments being conducted in another part of English electric areas on road traffic control. So the use of the computer began to spread. This is what a typical use looked like. This is, in fact, the, uh, the, uh, perhaps the system showing the three machines. Um, these, in fact, were producing very high reliability because at any point in time, all three machines were running the same program on the same input. Two of them were being compared, and if they agreed, the output of one of them was used. If for any reason either of them disagreed, the one that was still working was compared with the third machine. If that concurred, then the faulty machine was switched out of existence and given for service, and the other two took it over. So this gave a high reliability of system, but it did mean we had three machines. I did mention the fact that we were now working with transportable systems, and this is a, an example of one of our systems. At the, at the rear, you can see the surveillance radar and its cabin housing its transmitters. On the foreground here, you have the height finder. And in the cabin over on the left-hand side, you have the display system. Now, all of these could be either lifted by helicopter to put in or would run on road systems and be towed into position. This is what the interior of the display system looked like at the bottom of the cabin with the computer also mounted in there. So we're still working with a system where you have a collection of displays and controls working to the necessary system. Just to show the sort of environment that we were stuck with, that is the surveillance element of one of these convoys. That is sitting on top of Mount Kent during the uh, Falklands War. And the other equipment was housed in similar radomes alongside. So. Um, we weren't always in particularly friendly environments for computer systems. Now, Myriad worked extremely well, and it was such a success that the company decided they would carry on the range. And so they decided to carry on with Myriad 2. Now, this was mounted on a rack mounted system because we had discovered that other applications coming up didn't really need the full power of the Myriad. So we were able to cut it back. And this was, in fact, effectively a smaller computer. But the basic couldn't configuration could be extended right up to the full Myriad one if you wanted it. It was designed in two cabinets, one containing the central processing unit and the other the store system. And the whole thing was controlled from a separate desk, which contained all the power supplies and the operator's console. And this is what Myriad two looked like bit more conventional with a cabinet on one side with the equipment in and the control desk still with the flexor writers controlling it it had several applications the royal hospital in belfast took it over for a medical system a steel plant at port talbot took it over for production of steel and london transport wanted to look at a system to control i don't know why the number 11 bus route but that's what they wanted it for and they were also looking at it to control all of the London traffic lights in the rest centre of London. There was also a defence communications centre coupled with our communications um, company as well, and they took it over. We also built an in-house bureau because by now software was becoming a requirement and we needed the system to develop it. Myriad 3 came along after this, and of course technology had moved on, so this was being completely re-engineered to use the native technology. 
Again, it was built as a series of modules for 19-inch rack mounting, and it worked with, with ferrite core stores fairly rapidly. The idea was to have two self-contained units and one power supply for every module. Now, unfortunately, although it was a very high-spec machine, it never actually saw customer service, and I'll explain why in a moment. It was a very elegant machine, uh, working now with transistor transistor logic, containing Elizabeth microprograms, etc. With an operator control unit that could be plugged in on the end of a long cable, so it was capable of being installed in various places. It had a programmer engineer's control unit separated off, and a major matter in inclusion was the master peripheral unit, where Peripherals could be connected either by a radio system, a highway, or a combination. And it was unable to put any sort of power distribution or the peripheral device that somebody wanted. So that it was going to be configured exactly as any customer required. Unfortunately, as I said, it didn't get really use. We did build an in-house bureau with it, and it was evaluated at RRE, but it never got any further. However, if you actually look at all our records, there was a total, we think, of 58 myriads of whatever shape and size were produced for the whole system. This is by now what a typical air traffic control system looked like. At the top left there, you've got surveillance area coupled with a secondary radar providing data being connected into the main system, as you can see, by uh, scanners working to a central computer system which had all sorts of peripheral controls involved putting all sorts of parameter systems in and working at the bottom to particularly whatever particular design of display system the client wanted so we were able to make variations of this to meet pretty exactly any condition that people wanted uh, to start installing computer driven systems just as a matter of interest, this shows how things have progressed. The outer ring is our old valve system, very complicated, very heavy, very bulky. The next rig in were the tack boards, and now you are down to the myriad boards as shown in the center. So already things are shrinking quite rapidly. Now, it's essential at this point in time to look at where Marconi fitted because this was the time when the government had decided it wanted to try and sort out the UK computer organization. And so this is a, a diagram of what was intended. As you can see over on the left here, you've got the Lion system, you've got Leo and the English Electric system, coupled with ourselves being fed into a new English Electric Leo Marconi. Now, RCA is shown at the top there because Marconi, right from day one, had, had a link with the RCA company in America. It started out, in fact, as the American Marconi company. So they had access to what the RCA were doing in the way of designing computers. Down at the bottom here, we have the National Physical Laboratory, and they'd worked with Inks Electric to produce the LACE, the DEUCE, and the KDF series. So that came all into English Electric. That was then going to be linked with international computers and tabulators, which itself now had been connected with GEC, which itself had taken over the Elliott organization organization. But all of this was just for the commercial side. As you can see, military and process control systems were still out external. And the whole lot was put together. And in 1968, the government produced the International Computers Limited, ICL. So Marconi was still in the game, but in a different sort of manner. Following all this reorganization, we were still working, of course, mainly in our own area, which was, which was radar systems. And it was pretty obvious that what they were intending and wanting was not providing a sensible basis for what we wanted. Now, round again, it was a rather appropriate time because the first real silicon integrated circuits were becoming available. First, there was just a memory chip and then the arithmetic chip. But one of the engineers in the research area saw how now, with the way things were going, we would start thinking in terms of intelligent terminals. 
where in fact you did not have a computing system coupled to a display control system, you could start merging the two together. And this triggered the design of a completely new system, which we call Locus 16. Now, this used a printed backbone, and it provided the communication between what were in fact small computer systems on the board, the memory, the display drivers, and any other devices that were needed. Each of these was housed on a smaller printed circuit board, which was then plugged into the back plane. So we could build up an intelligent terminal by simply using the necessary device on the board and plugging it into the terminal back. This had very great advantages in the, the very time. Integrated circuits of increasing power could provide higher capacity storage and more elaborate processes on the same system. So we can modernize the product now while retaining an unaltered back lane. So the redevelopment, the engineering of the development system was now much easier. This in fact is what a locust board now looked like. As you can see, it's full of what we would now refer to as integrated circuit systems with a plug-in system. And that all went into now a bin. So we have successfully reduced from four racks to a desk size to what is now a bin. In fact, if you had a very simple locus system, you no longer even had to have a separate power supply. You could put a smaller one in part of the locus bin and you had one compact system. So that is the earliest locus 16 that came out. The initial system was a 16-bit bus architecture based, as we said, on a plug-in backplane. It had 2K 16-bit memory cards, and it contained a basic arithmetic and logical processor with separate multiplication division processors, and it supported its own user code. We had the display processor, which incorporated graphic and tabular displays, which we'd already been produced. We had serial links for passive communication systems, we also built in a basic diagnostic processor and we could do dynamic store allocation, which at that time was a fairly unusual activity. So ultimately, we were able to expand this system. And I know there's a lot of text on here, so but as these are going to be available to be seen afterwards, I don't mind having a slightly busy store because we were simply able to augment what we were doing with bigger memory cards, we could add newer processors, we could support higher languages, we could do any autonomous display system that we wanted to do, and we could do a full multiprocessor operating system. We were told by some American people we talked to that this wasn't possible. We were quite happily able to multiprocessor systems together. It was implemented as a local processor operating system for each type, and you could enable different processes to collaborate in the same system. So what we were able to do was use effectively the same system, but reconfigure it for different jobs. And the software development system was developed for editing, compiling, and system building. And we had absolutely rigid software configuration control, which I'll refer to later. This is what the final board looked like, an ALP arithmetic logic processor and as you can see it isn't really very different to the initial one this meant that the ultimate locus system the much improved system was actually looking almost exactly the same as the initial one we no longer had to redesign the engineering we simply reconfigured the plug-in boards to take on the new jobs this is a typical sort of system that we will produce, IUCAG, which I'll talk about a bit more in a moment. But in particular, I want you to note two things. One is how the, lo the, lo the locus bus in the center has all the different processes configured into it, and how we had a driver for each effort. And above, you will see the three types of display with a driver going to each one. So we were able to, within this system, to configure exactly what was necessary for a particular client's job. So I'm not quite sure now whether we're talking about a computer. We're actually talking about a whole set of computers, but now all condensed into one system. Now, if you just carry that image through in your mind, here you see what it actually looked like. 
and it was working on the improved UK air defence ground environment, our, our next development of the UK system. And there you can see the three displays, as you saw, sticking out at the top of the previous diagram. And they were no longer being driven by rows of racks. We simply had a Locust 16 system that slid into the back. So that could be taken out, reconfigured, and a new system developed almost without change. So what we have now is the improved UK air defence ground environment workstation, rather than how we were calling it. And that could be adapted to provide a role dependent facilities, depending on where it was in the system. We had soft control data processes, so we were very flexible. It had a special high order language, what we call position description language. And this is where we were able to configure the system to do a particular job. So it was a major advance in the cost effective systems with C3I in the needs, control computing and com communication. We could implement a very large multi-level system with workstations that were more or less identical, but with detailed functions for a particular role determined by tables, which are in themselves generated using the PDL, and then stored in the system for loading into the workstation at logon. So any one station could be reconfigured <coughs> job in that particular position. So we were enabled the user to change what characteristics he wanted to meet his evolving needs without really changing anything in the system. The other project that really used a lot of locuses was in the civil world. And this is the <laughs> Scottish Air Traffic Control Centre. And um, that was called SCATSI. And in there, in 1974, the CAA contracted with us for a complete new ATC centre at Prestwick. It was going to be controlling air traffic in the whole of the Scottish region of the UK. It would take data from all the radar outstations and select which ones to use to which control. Tracking routines with the system to display targets in symbolic form so the operators had the best use of what information they got. Leader lines showing where the target was going, proportional to the speed. The bearing was represented by the target heading. The outstations had both primary and secondary radar sensors. So uh, nowadays they rely mainly on secondary. In those days, they had primary built in as well. The control displays then had the most complete data that we were able to give them on the air traffic. It was possible to extract the position, heading, speed, flight, and identity of any aircraft over the screen. And um, that system had 30 displays, and each of them was fed by the Locus engineered system, as you saw. Its function was to monitor all aircraft in the 2 million cubic miles of airspace above Scotland, North England, and the North Sea. And even then, having built that later on in the 1980s, it was even that was expanded and by simply adding new Locus systems. You didn't have to take out the old one and replace everything. Most important, I think, in the talk is not just the hardware that we've talked about, but one thing that at the moment, in my mind, is in particular focus, and that is the development of software. We all know what's going on at the moment. So the programming of the TAC and the Myriad was initially performed by the same hardware engineers who were developing the system, because, of course, that was how things worked in those days. But as demand for the software increased, it was decided that it became a dedicated activity. So we were, in fact, recruiting programmers to come and work for us, and mainly they were raw graduates. The Coral language which we used, and the Mini Coral, was developed in conjunction with RRE in the 60s, and we had a compiler built in the 70s. The initial projects were developed very informally, I think, like anyone else did, but it became apparent very rapidly that discipline was going to be required. So a set of development procedures was introduced around 1970 for the flight plan processing system, which we talked about earlier, the one that was installed at West Drayton. And we decided by the late 70s, even these had become a little inadequate. So a formalized definition language is developed to formalize requirements at a very early stage. And an even more sophisticated set of procedures developed in the 1980s. And we changed scope in a little way in that we programming became software engineering. 
because we decide it must have the same disciplines of control as building the hardware. And I don't think that was done by many other people. We also developed automated development tools to support the procedures, but again, the rigid software control built in. And that was what we originally used for the UCAG system that I talked about. The company also helped, in fact, in the development by the uh, MOD and the real time, what was called real time control policy in the 1980s. And quality management, which I think most of you in big companies will have met before was then extended to include specialist software quality engineers as opposed to development engineers in the 1980s. So we built into our software structure the same disciplines that we were already practicing, we think very successfully, in the hardware engineering. So during all of this time, the software matured. And again, I apologize for the rather solid screen but it's necessary to really go right through it. So all the time we were learning about this process of system and software and how to divide it into whole systems, how to stage a build up of subsystems, and more importantly, we introduced egoless reviews at every stage. So we moved from software obviously produced by a few software wizards, and our very large products required dozens of what we call softies usually split into several teams, all of which needed modeling together. Now, the important things were a stable requirement with a detailed design, which identified all necessary modules to start with. The UCAG requirements teams were led by ex-REF operational staff, and they attended all the design reviews and carried out operational testing before the software was offered for acceptance to ensure that the requirements were being correctly interpreted by the software teams. Testing was planned in right from the start with a software test team attending all the reviews to check that the system was testable and then planning how to do it. There was analysis of each module to define who, what and when, and especially the completion criteria, which would demonstrate we had successfully completed the item. There was weekly progressing against the timetable the plan was not allowed to be changed, so that all of the levels of management had transparency of progress against a relatively stable base. Replanning was only allowed at monthly intervals to concentrate attention on, say, the 50 most critical items. Now, despite all this, of course, all in all, infallibility is almost certain beyond reach, and latent problems will continue to haunt systems. Were such problems in, hidden in the TAC system? We don't know. But we do know that in Furhat, the TAC delivered service in whatever form for approaching 40 years, which again is not a bad record. Company policy now comes into view. Remember, this is the time when GEC was taking everybody over. And Marconi Computer Systems Limited expressed no interest whatsoever in the Locus 16 concept. We all considered this was a lost opportunity as backplane technology was being introduced by DEC at about the same time, and of course has become virtually universal, notably in the IBM personal computer and the clones. Yes, a substantial marketing investment would have been needed, but a major business could have been built. But the potential was not recognized, and that's the reason why the Marconi computing capability never further developed and, in fact, disappeared altogether. But within our own organization, Lucas 16 became the mainstay of our radar control and display systems. And from records located to date, we reckon a conservative total of over 500 Locus installations were delivered, incorporating multiple processors. So that, if you've been keeping count, means we have an estimated total of multifunction Marconi radar systems approaching 600, which we consider is not a bad total. Just as a matter of a final interest from engineers' memories, which I got from colleagues while I was preparing this presentation, we were told that the lecture on car electronics, that the chip in each door handle of a modern car used 32K of storage. Our engineer remarked that we used to get the software for a complete air traffic air defense system in this amount of store, 
including tracking aircraft performance data and display management. It was also stated that some cars now had more lines of code than the Typhoon fighter. So he said, so things must now either be bloody sophisticated or the code very inefficient. <laughs> now, part of this is programs were in fact smaller because we use machine code, one-to-one -one, compiled for user code. And that is very much more efficient on both memory and runtime than machine code derived from high level languages. But that was what we had to use. We used to reckon on mini cobbler being about five times bigger and 10 times slower on execution. So that is why we continued doing it the way we wanted. This led after our chat to a very interesting conclusion. We thought triggered by these memories and the continual reports of systems failing as is happening, as we know at the current moment, is this due to the fact that, as in the early days, programs were commonly written initially by the same engineers who were responsible for meeting the system specification and then designing the required hardware within known constraints. So from the beginning, they knew the whole intimate performance detail from design to completion. Now, in general, as time progressed, the creation of software became a separate task carried out by software designers. So was it a common practice to do as we did and develop what we called software engineers, or did it become the norm to work independently to a software specification and then become divorced from the actual system needs and work to a different set of constraints? So performance deviated from design, not by intent, but by circumstance. I, I, I pose that as something that I think is worth discussing. Things haven't disappeared completely. The Bado laboratories were eventually taken over by BAE Advanced Intelligence Laboratories, and they are now working on microelectronic systems. Teledyne E2V, remember I mentioned that Marconi established a factory specifically for designing magnetrons in World War II. This was, in fact, the, uh, uh, the science laboratories taken over, and it is now Teledyne E2V, English Electric, were taken over. And they are now designing power circuits, industrial machine, vision systems, semiconductors, space and defense imaging, scientific imaging, and big advanced systems. So part of what the Marconi about the people were doing is carrying on. And finally, Leonardo, who we had got into contact with during one of the big takeovers, they are carrying on designing things like shipboard systems. So although Marconi itself has disappeared, it hasn't actually vanished completely off the system. So I do feel that, that Marconi is still actually with us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Alan, thank you for that uh, fascinating talk. Uh, you covered an enormous amount of ground. Uh, we have some questions. If people, uh, particularly remote uh, people, uh, if you want to ask questions, please uh, type into the uh, chat box and uh, I will work my way. Uh, through the questions uh, as we go. Uh, and uh, can I start uh, perhaps? Um, Roger, Roger, yes. can you unshare Alan? Oh, right, Alan. Uh, yes, okay. Um, I've just got a picture of me, of me on the side and Zoom in the middle. <laughs> There we are. Oh, You're no. now. Uh, we now see the real. Now I'm one. Of, now I'm one of many. Yep. <laughs> yes. Um, there's a, a question here about the hardware that was used. Uh, Eric Bodger asks, "What hardware was used in the? Oh, <laughs> sorry, it's disappeared. In the original Swift system. Swift. It's the, the the hardware that was used. What hardware was used? Uh, sorry. What do you mean the Swift system? My understanding is that Marconi was uh, responsible uh, in Essex somewhere for the uh, SWIFT development, the uh, international uh, money transfer. 
not to my knowledge while I was there and while Marconi and while Bradley was doing what I've just described, it might have been the Marconi communication systems, of course, which we did provide them with hardware to do their job, but that was an entirely separate company. Oh, yeah. Okay, I'm pretty sure. Mar Mar the, this was, the, the Bado basically was concentrating on what we now what became the radar side of the business. Understood. So I'm afraid I can't. I can. I can ask around my colleagues and see if anybody comes up with an answer. But I myself don't know. As a Mar ex Marconi comms man, I yes, can't Mar remember. Marconi the, what they did was when GEC and so forth took it over, they divided the company up into companies. So you had Marconi Communication Systems Limited, which was a separate company from Marconi Radar Systems Limited. We became separate actual companies within, effectively still within the English Electric Organisation. Indeed. As the Marconi comms man, I, of the same vintage as yourself, Alan, Peter <laughs> Hopp, um, I can't remember doing anything at all on Swift. I'm, my background is the message switching systems that you were talking about. Yeah. And indeed, what is ironical hearing your talk is how we progress on a happily completely parallel path to yourselves with an equivalent of the locus having both of us come out of myriads to start with yes and uh, it was inevitable i think that we always tended to look on you guys as the opposition and yet quite honestly <laughs> i have as many friends in the radar company as probably the radar company have in the commerce company and we all had our our parentage in Marconi Wireless Telecoms may way, way back. We, we all had the same background and the same attitude to doing it. That's right. And it, it's fascinating listening to your memories because they're very similar to us. We started off, and uh, one of my big first memories is, in fact, the DCC in Whitehall. And we had a bunch of separate softies who did it. And uh, we also had system designers, which were a very rare breed. Yep. Nevertheless, we have incredibly similar backgrounds. Um, I think this was the company background. I mean, what one you know, people say once a Marconi man, always a Marconi man, and I think it was it wasn't just that. It was that we were inculcated with an approach to it, and that that is why I started right back with Marconi, because the way he, if you read Marconi the history and what we did, the way he worked with his colleagues was always the same. Mm -hmm. Yep. And I think that that, 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 that that got continued right through to every Marconi company that ever was. Yes, and I mean, we, we all shared the same. I'm an ex-Marconi apprentice, and yes. uh, that apprenticeship was the best damn thing I could ever have done. It, well, I, I, I effectively had a Marconi apprenticeship because I, I actually, like all kids of my area and you probably as well, had to do national service. And uh, because I had a sort of radio hobbies background, when I went into the RAF and went through the training, RAF GHB and then RAF locking, uh, and came out as a qualified radar uh, fitter, they actually retained me at locking as an instructor. So right. I instructed for the next uh, remainder of my career there, which most of the two years was all Marconi display equipment. So at the end of it, I just applied to Marconi and more or less walked into almost the same job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, I mean, it's happy days because it certainly was a very good, I did 40 years in Marconi and I have to say, I don't regret a single one of them. No, nope. but uh, that's life. I, I did 22 because I moved on for various reasons. <laughs> Well, I, I went back to Bado. I finished at Bado rather than starting there. <laughs> Just shows what a grip Marconi has. <laughs> Too right. Excellent talk. Thank you. I really appreciate right. it. Is there a question in the room? Yes. Uh, you talked about Myriad One having batteries for backup. Yes. When I was at Riddle Road, we were told that they had four minutes of batteries because after four minutes, once the nuclear stuff had landed, we didn't need the computers anymore. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably true. Yes, yes. No, it was it was an interesting experiment because as as basically you know now with transistors, you were driving things at what you might call battery voltages. They decided to have a go and uh, and see what they could do, and it, it turned out they they could actually provide enough power for the whole blessed machine from a battery bank. 
Yeah, they were lead acid batteries, and I remember them being recharged. Mm -hmm. After uh, hearing that about uh, the Myriad One, myself and Roger, who's sitting next to me, Roger North, we worked on Myriad Three, and I was one of the operators. And I don't know if you can see it on the camera over there. There's the MOS operating system manual. <laughs> Myriad oh. operating. I was actually operating the bureau in the computer room in eBlock. <laughs> right, stuff good, no, welcome to the club. And I've also got a user code manual here as well. <laughs> it, was a, it, was a, it was a great pity in one way, but I'm not sure that we would have gone on to Locus in the way we did, you know, had the organization permitted the development. But yeah. they, just, they just scrubbed it. It was, was it Tony Benn who did this big reorganization? The memory, my memory seems to remember Tony Benn was the organizer of the. No, it was bloody Harold Wilson, pardon my French. Yes, yeah, so we just got caught, we just got caught up in the middle of it. You know? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> but I think mainly because we were working on very large systems with very large organisations, you know, we were we were fairly isolated. I mean, the way the way we got on with the Swedes was very typical of how we approach things. If the if the customer showed the least inclination to be cooperative and talk about things as opposed to just demanding things, we got on very well. And I think that was actually a Marconi train, you know. Yep, absolutely. And again, we finished, or I, I finished for the comm side before I went to Bado, with a Swedish system, KV90, which was for their, their naval comms. Right. There and it, it was brilliant, and it carried on for bloody years as well. Mm. Well, but, I, I, apparently, uh, you know, the tack at TMOC is uh, ticking away quite nicely now. <laughs> Yeah, yeah and... question in the room here. Well, actually, it was more of an observation. I worked for a GEC unit in the late 80s, a small unit of GEC, and I think a lot of the issues you're talking about were due directly to Arnold Weinstock because his view was that GEC was a portfolio of small businesses. And I remember our managing director saying all he wanted from him was one sheet of a4 once a quarter saying money in money out profit that was it he wasn't interested in anything else that we were doing or synergies between the different units or anything like that purely about money as far as he was concerned and i think you know what you were talking about marconi this and marconi that and english electric is all due to that kind of mentality yeah but we had a very good managing director at the beginning with john sutherland and what he managed to do was deliver what nine stock wanted at the top, but let us get on with it properly at the bottom. <laughs> yeah. yeah, absolutely. <laughs> we had the pleasure of half Nelson for a long time. Yes, yes. Um, <laughs> and, and I mean, it was rumoured that Arnold hated computers with a passion, which is why my career included a stint in the systems analysis and programming group, because we weren't allowed to call ourselves computer systems division. <laughs> he hated them. No, I think I think we got away with it because we were still called radar division. Uh, indeed, <laughs> and I mean we all used to lie like hell because I can remember vividly at a tender there being asked by Fatty Saunders, "Has it got a computer in it? Only a very small one," says I. Oh, good, he said. <laughs> uh, are there remote questions that uh, anybody would like to ask? Uh, Yes, if I could uh, contribute, uh, Roger. Good to see uh, you. My, uh, I'm far too young to have um, worked in any of the uh, systems that we've just heard being described, but um, my father went to work for uh, Marconi Marine Telegraph Company in 1918. Right. And he worked with them till. 1926 when he joined the BBC and when I recall being as a teenager when we went to visit family in Lowestoft dad would go down to the uh, local Marconi office and manage to get us on board some trawlers in the um, docks there to look at the radar and other systems that uh, Marconi had on them so I've seen uh, some of the uh, outputs of your work but i never realized what went on behind the inside the cabinet so to speak 
Oh, good. Now, hopefully, you've got a little bit more knowledge. <laughs> yes, thank you very much. No, I, I think it was, it was the, the whole way that things were approached. I mean, the research, they were research laboratories. And, of course, we did have real scientists and researchers at one end. But don't forget, pretty well, all of that equipment I've described was actually made in Bado workshops. It did not go into the main works at New Street. We actually had a very capable system at Bado of manufacturing, effectively manufacturing kit. Mm. So it was almost it was almost model shop building, you know. I mean, cer cer certainly some of the when when stuff had to be made in large quantities, like the uh, cabinets and things like that. I believe that went to New Street because that could be churned out, you know, by them quite easily. But all the fittings that went inside and did the useful things were basically done at Bado. Of course, event, eventually, of course, we, 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 we hive things off. I mean, we even at one point, of course, had a Marconi micro, microelectronic company. So not it's only a... did we use transistors, we made them. Yep. The question at the back of the room here. Yeah, I, um, I, I, I was expecting you to say something about the GC4060 and 4070, which was the first computer, I, <laughs> <laughs> first computer I used uh, after graduating. Do, do you have any memory of those systems? I never used them. <laughs> uh, just, if I may interrupt, just recently, um, a very well-known and well-regarded, I'm not sure what you'd call him, Bollock Soshin was our Marconi comms man who poked his nose into all sorts of things. And we spent a huge amount of time and a hell of a lot of effort trying to justify the first ever VAX 11780 that came into the company as our bureau machine. And the Sosh was wished onto us and spent quite a long time with us trying to convince us to, to buy a GC4000. He went away hurt. <laughs> <laughs> not real time machines at all no uh, I, th I think this i think why i went through the beginning in the way i did was that we it, what we did but it's why and how and when we did it we you know i i do believe that we, in the marconi structure you you did something and that led you onto something else or a requirement came in <laughs> That more or less fitted what you did but you then have to think about a slightly different way of doing things oh yes we could actually do that if we did this yep. and then that was submitted to what was usually a very cooperative management structure and provided it was reasonable i, I think you got the go, go got the go ahead i mean at bado for example i, I don't know whether other people know him but dr eastwood who remember you know had been That's... a senior raf officer working with radar and of course, an awful lot of our engineers came back from the services and had service experience. So when we were talking to other people who were going to use or needed and had a need for something like a defense system, we had people who actually worked on things like that. And they knew how it worked and what it probably needed to do, not just as a theoretical design. And we had great communication all the time within the company from people who said, yes, but with a bit of knowledge. Exactly the same with Marconi comms, where we ended up with huge numbers of Army and Navy, very few Air Force, surprisingly, comms people. And uh, that's why at one stage, every ship in the Navy had Marconi comms on it. Yes. Oh, they did right from square one. I mean, that, yeah. that, that's a whole new story. But, you know, it, it, it's, it, it was cer in certain areas, I think we developed expertise that was a highly regarded by customers partly because half of our people came from them <laughs> yes i ha i have to say i think that the, the change to gc was probably one of the worst things that happened to marconi and then ultimately in the long term the takeover by bae was an absolute bloody disaster <laughs> we've got a question in the room uh, yeah, hi, I'm Barry Jones. I, I've worked at um, Bado and Points West, including West Drayton, for six years. Uh, <laughs> I saw the, um, I was a member of the working group that de-scoped the West Drayton system because the 32K Myriad wasn't big enough to do the whole job. 
And um, obviously at this point, the Myriad 3 was, I think, was at prototyping level. So Marconi's proposed that as a, a replacement for the Myriad 1s we had at West Drayton. Um, and unfortunately, as one of the Marconi reps on the working group, uh, the team couldn't convince me that they had a mechanism for porting all of the existing software onto a paged memory system. So, wow. I, uh, so my uh, support for Myriad 3 was, shall we say, best half-hearted. But at the same time, the, um, uh, the, the people in what became the Civil Aviation Authority, um, I think the, the lead of that group had done a tour as um, civil, air, civil Air Engineering Attaché in Washington. So he was uh, very friendly, shall we say, with the IBM 1920 development team. So w without established technology to um, um, sort of enable the evolution of the Marconi system, uh, well, the, the not much we could do to resist the um, evolution <laughs> of the IBM system. <laughs> Uh, well, I, I the Myriad, Myriad 3 really was a sort of natural progression, but of course it got caught up in the machinations of the changes. So I'm not at all sure it got a fair chance, so to speak. Yeah, uh, but uh, I um, subsequently joined the CAA and found myself um, uh, managing the project to uh, replace the uh, Myriad system at West Drayton. And uh, about halfway through that, we de-scoped it to military only as well. Um, so uh, that, uh, there's a bit of a history there. <laughs> I don't know quite, you know, what would, what would have happened. I mean, you know, if you think back to when Locust came in and the idea of the back planes and things like that, they were the sort of ideas that were being generated from both people who were pushing the, pushing the envelope, so to speak, on the researchers, but being working with people who were actually using it and knew the disadvantages and advantages of doing things in a particular way. And it was because the two sets, you know, cooperated and coordinated that what came out the end usually was pretty good. Yeah, and I think we've also forgotten that the fact that in between times we had not only the, the dead hand of IBM where you couldn't ever be wrong by buying IBM, you no. also had the, a raft of other people from every corner of the world who were poking their noses in with similar amounts of experience that we had. And our experience, and I'm talking about the, the Marconi-specific experience in terms of the specialist experience in radar and in comms, had been watered down. Mm. Well, we'd had, I mean, certainly I think when I, when I left, it wasn't quite the same company as, um, you know, what it had been. I didn't leave for technical reasons. I left for salary reasons. <laughs> I, I think that was a similar curse to all of us, Alan. Yeah. No, I, I put, I put, I, one day I was looking at a, uh, an advert. I think it was in Electronics Weekly. Uh, and by that time I had moved, I'd moved out of system design. And I, I was actually by then the, uh, uh, basically the, the manager for all the external public relations side more, more than anything else. Cause I've always had the capability of writing and talking. And so I, I used to generate all the company's literature as well. And I just poked my head up one day and answered an advert in the, uh, in the electronics top weekly, uh, for a similar sort of position. Uh, I did move and I doubled my salary. Yeah. <laughs> Probably got time for one final question. Uh, is there a question online that someone would like to ask? In that case, can I invite uh, Chris Reese to uh, thank can I just say, Can I just say one more thing? You <laughs> notice at the end of the presentation, I have left a little. Um, uh, HDL for uh, running onto our system. I shall be mounting the slides themselves, of course, this not 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 necessarily the recording that we've made here, but all of that information will be mounted on my wiki. I I maintain this series of twelve wikis which cover all of the Marconi activities online, and they're always accessible by just asking to get on. 
so I will be including all the slides and everything on there to be able to look at. And if anybody has any more questions or can add something, <laughs> that's, that's how I built up this from four years ago by having people talking about it. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay. Sorry. Thank you for that. And it, it, this recording will, or uh, technology permitting, uh, go up on uh, on the CCS YouTube channel uh, yep. in the next few days. Uh, Chris, would you like to conclude? Well, Alan, thank you very much. I think we've all learned a hell of a lot about Marconi. Uh, I was coming from zero, uh, and I feel a little bit more knowledgeable, and I suspect that a lot of those who are steeped in Marconi, and you clearly have a number of them, uh, it's been a really fascinating presentation. So thank you very much for that. Uh, thank you all for coming, whether in person or online. And can I just mention that uh, our next um, uh, event, Jürgen Müller, we'll be talking about Tiny Ace on the 15th of February, and David Holdsworth on the Eldon 2 multi-access system at Leeds uh, on March the 21st. So we look forward to seeing you then. Uh, have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.